Hello and welcome everybody who is joining this uh, session. We will have a pleasure to hear out uh, uh, our colleague Slobodan, who is the one of our more distinct, most distinguished solution architects. Uh, he will share uh, his experience on the topic we all uh, discuss and, and chat from time to time, but we dig into this only when uh, going to get stuff. So Slobodan, take it away. Thank you very much, Nikola. So hi, everyone. My name is Slobodan Buljanovic. I'm working as a solution architect in HTEC Group. And today I'll be talking about performance optimization in software systems, a topic that I believe is interesting uh, due to the fact that virtually every software engineer will sooner or later get the opportunity to face this kind of challenge. And although I know that today we'll be able only to scratch the surface, let's go briefly through the agenda for today. So uh, at the beginning, we'll provide a brief introduction about software performance basics. And um, after that, uh, we will uh, we'll, uh, tell something about performance testing, try to explain what is the role and importance of performance testing. Then we'll touch common problems that may be detected by performance testing. Uh, next one, we'll mention some levels of optimization and the techniques available for optimization. Some of them will be elaborating in more details. And after addressing one of the interesting questions, namely, when to optimize, uh, finally, we'll uh, provide a few real-world examples. So uh, performance is essentially about measuring how effective a software system is with respect to two basic things, one, time constraints, and second, allocation resources. And I'm emphasizing the both aspects because you'll see during one of the examples, I'll reference this statement again. So to be practical, we can say that performance is essentially a capability of a system, of a software system to provide a certain response time or to serve a certain number of concurrent users or to provide certain throughput. So it is obvious that performance is a software quality metric. And I think it's useful to say that generally speaking, when dealing with performance imp uh, uh, improvements, that it is uh, practically impossible to come up with a, a fully optimal system. Instead, most of the time, our main focus will be on, on one and maybe most two relevant aspects. And for the others, we'll have to make some kind of trade-offs. Um, as a illustrative example, for example, when designing distributed systems, the rule of thumb would be to aim for a maximum throughput with some reasonable response time or latency. It is simply due to the fact that distributed uh, systems, for example, are not so convenient and were not designed to minimize the latency, for example, we use distributed system mostly in the cases when we need to maximize uh, throughput and scalability. So for the other things, we'll have to make that some kind of trade-offs that I'll be talking about later. Uh, there are many reasons why performance is important. As an illustrative example, in front of us, there is a list of features, architectural features, otherwise well known as the six pillars of the well architecture framework as defined by one of the main cloud vendors today, AWS, which is indisputable authority in this area. So you can see that performance is put uh, along with the features such as security, reliability, cost optimization. So as a conclusion, we can definitely say that performance definitely matters. Okay, let's touch uh, topic of performance testing. I would say that performance testing is irreplaceable part of the story. It is about uh, measuring certain different kinds of parameters under a variety of load conditions. Those parameters can be responsiveness, speed, scalability, or stability. And many kind of metrics can be used, some of them being response time, error rate, resource utilization, et cetera. But bottom line, there are fundamentally three uh, goals of uh, performance testing. So first one is that when we want to figure out whether our system meets performance criteria, 
This is particularly important when we need to meet uh, very strictly and explicitly defined performance requirements, which is, by the way, not always the case, or we need to uh, follow and match some kind of service level agreement. Second goal can be uh, simply to compare two systems to figure out uh, which one performs better. And when I say two system, of course, in practice, it is possible to be a single system that is uh, run uh, using two completely different con configurations simply to see which one is better from the performance perspective before, for example, we are going live. And the third one is um, simply when we want to understand clearly what is causing our system to perform badly. So in, in other words, I would say that performance testing is about we put our system into some circumstances and we want to observe the behavior of our system. So typical examples would be to put our system under a planned load to see what happens. Then the next step would be to put in under extreme load to, to test what are our limits and uh, what are our safety margins. Another example would be to figure out whether our system scales and how good, uh, then how it behaves under a sudden change of, uh, of, of uh, load. Another scenario would be to, to figure out and understand what happens on a long-term scenario. Are there any member leaks? Is there any significant performance degradation or similar? And another aspect interesting might be okay, let's introduce a huge amount of, of data in our system, most likely when facing big data scenarios and, and see what happens. So that's the uh, story about performance testing, some fundamentals, and uh, without any doubt, it is a very powerful tool, almost inevitable in case of performance improvements. So let's say that we did perform performance testing, so let's touch some common problems that can be detected. Uh, so we may run into some kind of speed issues, either being a slow responses, so low speed, or some long load times that can be problematic. Okay, we can also face some throughput issues, or maybe we can identify certain uh, bottlenecks, otherwise known as the hotspots. And speaking about bottlenecks in the system, it's useful to just to mention that's something that is known as a power low distribution, which says, and that is based on a practical experience, which says that approximately 9% of the execution time is spent ex executing 10% of the code. And those 10% is a probably good candidate to identify and isolate our possible bottlenecks in the system. Another one would be poor scalability, or maybe in case that we figure out that our system doesn't scale at all. We can also face some kind of software configuration issues, such as the scenario with unavailable ports or insufficient memory allocated, et cetera. And also there is a possibility to figure out that there, are, there is insufficient resources involved, such as a lack of memory, disk, or network. And, but fortunately, these days, that can be fairly elegantly resolved using elastic nature of cloud. Okay, so uh, let's mention some of the uh, uh, performance improvement techniques that are available. This list is certainly not exhaust exhaustive one, but let's mention some of them that could be really useful to know. So let's start with profiling, which is essentially about measuring the frequency and the duration of function calls. And that is a very good way to, to isolate and improve our bottlenecks. The next one is about uh, making code related optimization, that is naturally probably the first thing that a developer can think of. So it, mu it must be my code that can be optimized. But keep in mind, this is just an although eligible technique. This is just one of the many. Next one is uh, about load balancing, for example, then different kind of indexing techniques that are particularly useful where, when, when dealing with different kind of databases, either relational or NoSQL based. Then there, is, there are many caching strategies. For example, starting from in-process, in-memory caching solution, then going through uh, introducing distributed caching solutions such as Redis or Memcache on, and up to the solutions such as content delivery network. Those are all different kind of levels and uh, they can give us a lot of maneuvering space. Another two techniques that are, I believe, belong to the family of techniques that, that is about divide and conquer. 
So one is uh, parallelism and this very interesting technique that I'll be talking about details later. Another one is introducing distributed computing when we are in position to apply some powerful algorithms such as MapReduce or to use distributed computing frameworks such as Apache, Hadoop, Spark, Storm, Flink, Samza, and similar. Another story is, of course, regarding scalability, either vertical or horizontal. There are many use cases that both techniques are eligible. So when we want to scale our system in and out, up and down, and similar. Um, another technique that is worth mentioning is a story about introducing asynchronous patterns and techniques that, are, that shouldn't be underestimated. They're very powerful. And finally, there is a situation that we can decide even to create something that is um, known as a self-tuning system, systems that are capable to intelligently react to performance uh, challenges, um, otherwise known as an auto-scaling system that is a basic option and even more advanced when artificial intelligence and machine learning are involved. So as you can see, uh, there's a plethora of techniques available, and it seems that a lot of knowledge and experience is needed when dealing with performance. But uh, fortunately, there is one thing that's, again, worth mentioning. Um, there is um, good news about that, because most of the time, or often, the greatest improvements regarding performance come early in the process. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit during the um, story one, our examples. So uh, let's mention also optimization levels. Um, as you can see, this list is um, based on how big impact can certain level have on performance. And this is sorted by descending level. So most importantly, the first three levels are worth mentioning. The first one, of course, is the most important, I would say. Um, I, I cannot emphasize enough how important is design or architecture level, if you prefer when designing any kind of software system and what kind of benefits can be uh, gathered by uh, um, coming up with a proper design. On the other side, mistakes made on this level can be very painful, not only for performance, but the other aspects as well. <clears throat> Second level is about algorithms and data structures. And yes, they're very important when dealing with performance and there should be no uh, surprise is knowing that uh, many companies introduce this topic as a standard part of their technical interviews. Uh, third level is just to mention uh, source code level. Of course, there are many techniques depending on programming language, and compiler and the other things and many interesting ways how to opti optimize our code. For example, one of the interesting scenarios with dealing with optimization of C, uh, SQL, which is the language of relational database. So a lot of things could, could be encountered. And again, I'll elaborate a little bit more in, in, uh, later about this one. So the remaining levels are mostly about, uh, and usually provided out of the box from the tools that we use. So I won't go into the details, but let's just mention it's about using building tools, compilers, assembly that is usually automatic, generated then runtime, et cetera. And uh, mostly it is about how to properly use our tools. Well, I think in order to be able to competently deal with the performance related issues, uh, we need to be familiar with the fundamentals. Fundamentals are essential and really matter. One of them, in my opinion, is regarding uh, related to the multi-threading concept, which is um, mostly the way how majority of operating system provide support for concurrency and parallelism today. And besides, I would say that besides the, the, the strict need to strictly and clearly understand the difference between concurrency and parallelism, uh, some other techniques are relevant when dealing with this kind of scenarios, such as, for example, the threading issues that might uh, appear when dealing with this kind of scenario, such as race conditions, deadlocks, starvation, and the other scenarios. There's also a story about threat safety. We need to be able to protect our shared resources and to avoid data inconsistencies and uh, of any kind and uh, uh, to be able to react accordingly. There's also part about threat synchronization the story about mutexes, semaphores, critical sections that are also useful to be familiar with. 
another important part is to clearly understand what kind of uh, threading support is offered by the programming language or technology that we use. Also, one interesting part is our familiarity with uh, so-called concurrency control techniques, one of them being locking, so familiarity with different kinds of locks. And uh, another aspect is to uh, clearly understand also uh, the story about pessimistic versus optimistic concurrency control, which is essential and very, very important in, in your scenarios one, when we deal with uh, relational or other databases and their asset compliance and implementation on different isolation levels, et cetera. And uh, another scenario would be when dealing with really sophisticated multi-threaded based scenarios. And also I would say that it is important to understand that the difference um, between using low level versus high level APIs. The fact today is that by using high level APIs, uh, it, there is an elegant way how to achieve a lot of things using a very small amount of code. For example, in languages such as Java and C-sharp, it is amazing what is achievable by using a simply one uh, Java annotation or, or C-sharp attribute. However, we should be aware of, in, in case that we're in a position to, when we want to squeeze out the maximum from our system, we may be in a situation in which we have simply to reach the low level APIs, in which situation it is necessary to be familiar with the details, I would say. So this is the example of one of the fundamentals that really matter. Another one is around um, understanding the difference between asynchronous and synchronous approach in general. And I have to say all those synchronous approaches much closer to a human way of thinking. On the other side, asynchronous patterns and techniques are pro from performance perspective, much more powerful tool. And I think that essentially is to understand, for example, what kind of benefits we can get by introducing asynchronous approach in our system. For example, there is obvious difference between when dealing with a client optimizations, for example, the main benefit that can be gathered on client side is obviously responsiveness. A typical example is that we wouldn't want that our UI is frozen, for example, while waiting the response from the server. But on the server, it is a, difficult, a different situation on a server by introducing asynchronous patterns. The main thing that we can um, get is a combination of performance, both in terms of speed and throughput and scalability. Because simply due to the fact that, for example, a combination of a simple notification queue and a very small but efficient thread pool is, is much better than a synchronous approach, equivalent synchronous. It is also uh, important when dealing with asynchronous patterns and techniques uh, to be familiar with things such as uh, to understand the uh, difference between IO bound versus CPU bound operations. Well, one, one interesting, I would say ubiquitous example and scenario is about optimizing relational database. I mean, traditionally they've been uh, widely used and uh, they were dominant uh, for a couple of decades. And even today, uh, many systems are based on relational uh, databases and at least use them to some extent. So when dealing with this kind of performance and eliminating bottlenecks and performance issues, I believe that some family certain family of techniques are, um, is important to be familiar with. For example, when dealing with scenarios that include slow and long running queries, most likely due to some expensive locking you know, to the ability to understand and uh, react accordingly is important. Also, we should be aware of that relation database uh, write operations don't like indexes, but read operations love them. So we can be able, we should be able to make a proper decision uh, another thing is when dealing with SQL optimization within a code, uh, the ability to use profiler and to clearly understand the execution um, plan is very powerful technique. Also to understand performance impact that can have different SQL statements such as OR and, and operators then group by distinct union and similar. Also, we should strive to avoid expensive or nasty transactions uh, long story shortly, there are only troubles with them. Then the ability to use materials views, but only in cases that when they're appropriate and there are some. 
Also, one of the topics is a difference between transactional processing and analytical processing uh, to be able to understand the difference with a different kind of database schemas, for example, a third normal form, normalized option versus uh, schemas such as STAR and Snowflake and uh, the ability to, to, to deal with both. Also, I think that we should be familiar with different forms of CQRS patterns. There are many of them, simpler and, and, and more complicated ones. And also the story about scaling of relational database, it's simply the fact that due to the nature of a relation model, uh, uh, in terms of scalability, relational database are very grateful for vertical scaling. They love many CPU cores, a uh, lot of RAM, etc. However, scaling horizontal and relation database is not so natural act. So some kind of manual work is needed that can be tricky in sometimes because simply partitioning of relation database is not a, a trivial task. Um, okay, so a couple of words about the trade-offs that technical people are forced to make in some circumstances that I already mentioned. As I said, generally speaking, optimization will focus on, on improving one, or in some case, very rare two aspects that might be speed or throughput or memory usage or power consumption or similar. But for the other aspects, we'll have to make some kind of trade-offs. Uh, again, generally speaking, uh, trade-offs are usually, usually dictated by our business requirements. But from technical perspective, we want to make sure that all the stakeholders are fully aware of both pros and cons of each particular trade-off in order to be able to make a really good decisions about this. So uh, as a typical example, imagine a situation if we decided to introduce um, one distributed caching solution. And I would say in that case, by increasing the caching size, will most likely give us the benefit of improving speed, meaning runtime performance. However, at the same time, the same, uh, the same move would cause both, uh, would cause uh, increased memory consumption and it would increase the cost. So if we're in a position that the business dictates that the cost reduction is the prevailing parameter and the most important one, we may not be in a position to introduce expensive uh, caching solution. On the other side, if we are facing a situation in which uh, budget is sort of unlimited and we are allowed to do whatever needed to, for example, to be able to scale uh, globally and to be present globally, in that case, of course, we will have a lot of maneuvering space to do optimizations. Well, one of the interesting questions is, is when to optimize. And one of the best answers I've seen so far was offered by the guy named Donald Knuth, who is an indisputable authority in this area, <clears throat> who said something about, um, and I'm quoting, we should forget, <clears throat> sorry, about small efficiencies, which is approximately 97% of the time, according to Knuth. In other words, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I would say it's definitely true. But we, on the other side, we shouldn't miss the opportunity to do the optimization in those critical 3% of time. <clears throat> and I think this is the wise statement many, so many times confirmed from the practice. So, <clears throat> and I would say also say that in practice, it is often necessary to keep performance goals in mind when at the very beginning, when we design our software. And although I know this is not always possible, maybe a hint from a practical experience when working with our clients, <clears throat> we should be proactive and uh, try to make sure that we work on uh, defining uh, so-called non-functional requirements because performance is one of the most important uh, non-functional uh, non requirements. And I would say by achieving this in a very early stage, properly defining performance uh, requirements, it can be a very, very good payoff for the future. Okay, now we are entering um, a story about a few examples that I would like to explain and maybe to offer some useful information. And one of the, the examples was uh, one project that we participated in. 
it was happening uh, more than 15 years ago. And it was about one of those good old Java core based projects. Uh, and I'd like to briefly explain the scenario and maybe to try to offer our way of reasoning at the time that the actions that we did and the results that we achieved. <clears throat> so the original team was facing, um, it was around text mining and the solution was computing intensive. And in uh, the original implementation was heavily using uh, many instances of hash maps, uh, ubiquitous and well-known data structure. And um, they were facing a few challenges. It was a highly concurrent scenario. I have to admit that the original team came up with a very good design about high level of concurrency. But the tricky part is that they didn't manage to provide the corresponding implementation, but design was very good. Uh, one of the things that was a must uh, was a threat safety that they couldn't afford um, the risk of, of uh, causing unpredictable behavior in the system. They, they were so about, uh, you know, um, keeping a low level of data consistency. Uh, and it was uh, all the hash map instances were under very extremely high load of both read and write operations. Uh, so um, after doing a very careful and detailed analysis, we made uh, several conclusions and I'm about to tell you about some of them. So first thing that we noticed was that um, in order to instantiate those hash map instances, the original implementation was, was using the default constructor. As you may say that at the time of that implementation of Java JDK library, that implementation was using initial size of either eight or 16 key value uh, pairs and initial capacity, which was uh, definitely very low compared to the actual size that those hash map instances reached in the runtime, which was about between tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of key value pairs. And due to the, uh, by using the default con uh, constructor, the problem was that a lot of rehashing was happening. And as you probably know, rehashing is a very big enemy to the performance. So by only re replacing default constructor with a parameterized one, we introduced our capability to carefully tune the initial capacity of those hash map instances by putting them something uh, close uh, to the maximum. Uh, and fortunately, we were dealing with a bounded date scenario. So the sizes of hash tables were eventually limited, but fairly high. So we tuned initial capacity to be around maximum size of that the, the instance can reach, plus some safety margin that we introduce. But by doing that action, we effectively managed to completely avoid rehashing which provided a huge performance boost for the system. And I would say this was a fairly quick and easy win because the amount of code that was changed were several lines of code, you know? And I would say that quick wins are a very nice thing. I recommend them whenever possible. And this is also a good example of something that I already mentioned that uh, usually that the biggest performance improvements come early in the process especially when we make a thorough analysis and make proper decisions. So uh, the next step was around threat safety. Uh, again, the original implementation was using Java synchronized world uh, keyword in order to achieve threat safety. And uh, there is actually very tangible and a big issue with synchronized keyword because the underlying implementation uses a mutex lock. Uh, Mutex is a kind of a log that allows only one thread in time scenario. So although uh, the original team uh, provided a very good design for high level concurrency by using uh, Mutex log, they couldn't achieve the high level of concurrency. Instead, that was sort of a, a sequential access of both reads and writes. And by only replacing that synchronized keyword, with a fairly efficient implementation of a reader writer lock, which was much more appropriate for this scenario, we managed to significantly increase the level of concurrency, especially in a scenario, one particular, because I have to say we were dealing with basically two scenarios. 
one scenario was uh, access pattern that more than 99% per, uh, percent of operation when accessing the hash map instance were, were reads and very occasionally some write operations were in place. And that was the easier scenario. In that scenario, read and write lock introduction um, again provided a significant performance improvement. It was also fairly easy, not so easy as the first one, but still a very nice one. However, it wasn't good enough for the second scenario. Second scenario was about uh, distribution of fairly equal amount of reads and writes around 50-50. And in that case, uh, it wasn't performing well enough. So we needed to come up with another solution. And the next thing that we tried, we started um, trying uh, con uh, optimistic concurrency control. So after removing all the locking mechanism, we also provided uh, inevitable uh, conflict detection and conflict resolution mechanism, which are necessary in case of optimistic uh, concurrency control techniques. However, the thing proved uh, to be inefficient. We simply didn't get the desired performance after, of course, performance, uh, thorough performance testing. And this was one of the um, unsuccessful attempting, attempts of us and of our team. And uh, although I have to admit that that was not the only unsuccessful attempt, um, I have to emphasize that as a team, we learned a lot of lessons in this project and for example, some of them being how to use uh, profilers and benchmarking, how to use uh, performance uh, testing efficiently in a repeatable manner. And one thing that really we learned is, was how to fail. And even more importantly, we learned how to fail fast. And from that perspective, that was a priceless experience for our team. Uh, Next step that we decided to introduce was the implementation of something that I would call the sort of uh, variation of the interceptor pattern. We, we, we realized that uh, the, the expensive thing was about uh, write operations that required exclusive locks. And when that happens, all the others are waiting until exclusive lock is released. So we decided effectively to try with another approach. Uh, I, I have to mention that this kind of technique is to these days it's much better known than that was the case a long time ago and what we did we tried to uh, given that write operations are expensive we started queuing them we introduced a queue we were intercepting a write request putting them in the queue and when a certain threshold is reached and the threshold about uh, was about uh, two parameters either by reaching the maximum size of the queue or uh, a time slice expired under high to load. I sort of remember it was around 50 or to, to, to 100 milliseconds. So, and both parameters were configurable. So after reaching a threshold, then a group of uh, write requests were executed against the hash map. And that this uh, technique, it, it effectively what we did was a transforming a sort of streaming-like nature of arriving write requests into a batch processing, which in this particular case uh, brought a lot of performance improvement, really tangible one. And uh, again, as I said, uh, this technique is widely used in today's frameworks, one of them being, for example, Apache Kafka, for, for all of you who are familiar with Kafka, I can say that uh, it is very important when tuning Kafka in production to tune those kinds of parameters. So when sending messages uh, from publishers to the broker and from the broker to the subscribers, it is very, very uh, important to tune these kind of parameters and to deal with them properly, uh, especially in the production environments. And finally, we, we wanted to, to try to reach even better level of, of uh, parallelism by, uh, by due to the simple fact that uh, hash map as a data structure is very convenient for a horizontal partitioning. And the idea was to split uh, each individual hash map instance into several partition. At the time, we were aiming to be a similar to the number of CPU cores in the target machine. 
and we wanted to achieve a, a fact that by uh, I, I mentioned that the story about uh, exclusive locks and write operations. So when lock is acquired on, on a single instance of cash table, it's a single lock and everybody else is waiting. By uh, splitting into partition, it was possible at least to, to increase the level of write operations being executed in parallel. And that introduced additional level of, of uh, um, um, impro uh, impro performance improvements. Uh, well, no need to say, but just to mention, all these ideas and actions were thoroughly verified and tested against our system. So a lot of performance testing happened. And I can say as overall conclusion, it was a, a, a extremely good feeling about because the, we, we managed to achieve a great performance improvement and that was a pricelessly good feeling. Okay, so uh, before continuing with another example, uh, this table is about illustrating uh, the difference between the speed of different kinds of operations and this particular case emphasizing particularly the difference between uh, the RAM access, RAM operating memory access from CPU compared to the IO disk operations, either in case of HDDs or SSDs. And um, again, generally, according to this table, um, RAM access from CPU is between 1,000 and, and 10,000 times faster than a standard disk IO operations. And uh, the next example, which is one of my favorite examples, how uh, really good design can be uh, can have a positive impact on performance and a lot of other things was achieved due to that fact and that difference in speed by Apache Spark team. And this example dates back in 2014 when a Daytona Gray Sword contest was happening. So let me briefly uh, explain the, the, the facts about um, so Daytona Gray Sword competition was about uh, many companies uh, coming and showing off their big data processing achievements and, and frameworks and solutions. At the time, it was a sort of a matter of prestige. And uh, just to mention, uh, the, and, and the basic goal of the competition was very simple. It was about sorting 100 terabytes of data consisting of 1 trillion records to sort them as fast as possible, as simple as that. And just to mention, uh, a year before it, 2013, Daytona World Record was held by um, a Yahoo team with their Apache Hadoop MapReduce based solution. And before I present the results that uh, Spark team achieved at the time, uh, let me just briefly, uh, for you, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Hadoop and Spark, let me briefly uh, explain the difference between the two. So Apache Hadoop is essentially a distributed file system that leverages CPU and disk. So there's a cluster of machine and there is an API to use the overall disk of those uh, machines within the cluster as a distributed file system. And that, that was very powerful at the time that was definitely industry standard, standard for big data processing. On the other hand, uh, younger Spark team and the creators of Spark decided uh, not to reinvent the wheel so they decided to support Hadoop distributed file system out of the box from the very beginning. However, on top of that, the, the one definitely killer feature of Spark was the introduction, and that was the architectural design level, if you recall the uh, optimization levels, changed that uh, they were reasoning, if we already have a cluster and there's a lot of RAM memory, why wouldn't we leverage and squeeze off the maximum from that operating memory due to the fact that uh, access to memory, RAM memory is much faster than access to disk? So they created, and based on that uh, killer feature in their architecture, they managed uh, to, to break the world record at the time. And not only did they manage to break it, they did it in an impressive way. So let me present uh, the results. Uh, uh, Spark uh, actually managed to process the data three times faster using 10 times less machines. And if you recall my statement for the beginning, both 
time constraints and uh, and uh, resource allocation was very convincingly outperformed by Spark. So they managed to reduce the time from 72 to 23 minutes, so more than three times. And they were using 206 machine as opposed to previously uh, Yahoo based record, they, they were using 2,100 machines. So 10 times fewer machines. I guess you can imagine how, how big achievement it, this was at the time. And I, I have to say that was the beginning of the glory of Apache Spark and their community started growing. And at the time it was a, one of the biggest communities. And even today, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're getting the fruit from their initial design that was a really amazing. So a uh, very, very representative example of the great architecture. So level number one. Uh, another example was related to Twitter. Again, uh, at the time, they were facing a very interesting challenge about how to distribute tweets to the end users. And they were facing basically two scenarios. One was uh, the case of so-called normal users that had sort of, you know, a couple of dozens of followers. And there was a use case with celebrities, so-called, that had uh, several millions of uh, users. And those were difficult, uh, completely difficult scenarios, but they needed to achieve the same functionality to distribute the tweets. And they were targeting at the time, I believe, to do that up to five seconds. And that was a, quite a challenge. Eventually they implemented two, two different algorithms that proved be uh, very appropriate for each case. And eventually they merged those two algorithm into one. And this is a very representative story about the level optimization level number two, that was about algorithms and data structures and very notable exam example. And I believe that that kind of hybrid algorithm that they came uh, up with at the time is even used today, if I'm not wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, another nice example um, regarding the difference between ASIC and SYNC is, uh, and I've seen it uh, several times in my career, uh, a lot of legacy systems were based on pure, you know, relational database and standard approach was uh, all the operations regarding database were simply executed by calling synchronously one of the database APIs. And I can tell you that by just moving from synchronous to asynchronous equivalent of database calls, which are essentially IO bound, so blocking operations, it is possible, and as I said, I've seen it many times, to achieve several orders of magnitude better throughput and scalability and even performance. So several more, we're talking about thousands of times better results, you know? And I believe that is a recommended way uh, today to start as default. But that, that is just the power of uh, asynchronous uh, family of techniques and patterns that proved to be extremely efficient um, so many times in practice. And um, finally, I would like also to, to mention one interesting example. So did you know that, um, that uh, when Java platform was released, um, that was uh, by Sun and it happened uh, in 1995, uh, at that time, Java was considered to be a lousy per performing platform at the time. And uh, it took four years to the Java team to come up with a significantly better approach. And it happened in 1999 by the, by the introduction of a hotspot Java virtual machine, which was based on a two crucial features, namely, JIT compiler and adaptive optimization. And the combination of two finally provided acceptable performances to the Java platform and significantly contributed to the Java glory. And um, I, I have to say it is, um, it is obvious that that kind of achievement is, is, was a, quite a challenge given that it took four years and that, that is illustration how challenging can be situation when performance improvements are necessary. Again, very nice example, I would say. And uh, finally, as a conclusion, one thing, maybe the reason why I wanted to, to provide a hopefully a couple of uh, useful 
practical examples, I would say that one of the famous quotes of, of Albert Einstein that I really like. So he said, and I'm quoting, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. I mean, the main point being that although theoretical knowledge and background is a must, definitely. However, with it, without the practice, it is not a full story. I think that every theory has to be validated and proved against the practice. Because at the end of the day, practice is that the real world is all about. Okay, so uh, that's it for me. And we are entering a Q&A session. So please feel free to ask any yeah, questions. Great presentation. Uh, great presentation so well. <clears throat> we have a couple of questions. We'll try to answer some directly here in the in the uh, webinar and others we can uh, answer the in the offline mode. So the, the first question that came through is uh, about uh, uh, optimizing the SQL query. So you have a big database, you have your ex you run your explain plane, and you think you have the perfect result, but you don't have a matching environment to to test that uh, to test that assumptions and that improved uh, improved query. What would be the best approach? Where to test it? How to test it? Uh, what would be your takeaway? Oh, actually, that is a very very good question. Uh, I can offer my opinion. So. Uh, it is definitely a very big, or should I say, very beginner's mistake to perform a to, to perform performance testing against the environment that is not eligible for that. And uh, I remember a lot of times when the performance testing were was executed against a sort of a Mickey Mouse environment, but results were, were, were disappointing. When it came over production, there is no real replacement. Uh, when it when it uh, when it comes to about performance testing, so definitely the recommendation, one of the most important recommendation, whenever doing uh, performance testing, finally, you need it to execute uh, testing against uh, uh, the environment that is very close or, in ideal case, exact copy of production. Fortunately, is most of the cases the elastic. Uh, nature of the cloud can help a lot, you know, because by using cloud uh, vendors and cloud techni technology, we can very easily create uh, using infrastructure as code and other eligible techniques. We can very easily come up with a temporary environment, usually co uh, called staging environment, which is very close or identical to, to the production and then perform performance, uh, do performance testing. Only that kind of situation is really competent to give you a, a real over, uh, overview about what, what your system is capable with, what kind of issues it's facing, et cetera. So hopefully yeah. I, I managed to provide Thanks. a reasonable answer. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I didn't uh, convey uh, the best, but but here is a, really, a question is really specific about the SQL queries, not the overall testing and how can you explain plain uh, uh, help you to come up with a better query and test that query. So it's it's a query specific question. Uh, but again, yeah, staging is the one way. So you have a you can mimic the the environment uh, you have on production, or maybe oh. even run that query if you agree on production when are non peak hours. So it's it's uh, uh, select probably you're uh, optimizing uh, select statements, not the writes. You're not modifying database. So maybe those queries can be run in some uh, non-peak hours. So that wouldn't affect the end user. Yeah, and maybe maybe just to, approach it. yeah, maybe just to add on, uh, there are some kind of techniques that we can wisely, for example, uh, introduce a read replica of our master database, asynchronous one, in order not to jeopardize the master database with a fairly, you know, um, verbatim copy of our master database and then perform the queries against it. As I mentioned, profilers are irreplaceable tools to understand the situation, to deal with the performance bottlenecks, to understand the execution plan. And then of course we need to, to, to be careful about reading the specific documentation of that SQL database version, et cetera, to be able to, to react accordingly. Thanks, Lovon. 
Uh, we do have a couple of other questions, but we will answer them in the in the offline mode, not to uh, fiddle with the schedule. So thank you, Sobodan. Th thanks everybody for attending, and uh, thank you for your questions, uh, everybody who posted them. We will uh, we will try to answer them after this after this session. Okay. Thanks everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you.